Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and I'm very pleased to welcome my next guest, Jim McNeil. He was the founder of Ice Warrior Project back in 2001, and more recently, what is hitting the headlines is the Ocean Warrior Project and their venture into the Arctic. Welcome, Jim. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You are a man of summer now. You have been doing what you do as well, a former scientist. They say a former scientist, but you're always going to be a scientist. That's something that doesn't become a former and a polar explorer for the past 36 years. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us where you're from. What got you into science, firstly, and to further it on into polar exploring? I was an naughty boy at school, basically, and my school was an old boys school. It was a state school. I was born and brought up in a council house in London, which is a very humble background. But I've always been driven and I found the drive, really lucky to find the drive early on. I remember being, I was a school practical joker, so that was my outfit. <laughs> Not applying what little brain I had to matters academic. So yeah, I remember when I was 15 years old, sitting on a park bench in North London, looking down and being all teenage angst and hormones flying all over the place. And I thought, why do we exist? Why does why do we humans exist? But what was the sort of Moses moment was the fact that I thought, actually, I'm never, ever going to be able to answer that question. And nor is anyone else. So what do I do with this as a teenager? Here I am bunking off double maths or double physics or whatever it was, wasting my life at the moment. And in fact, I had a real interest in how things worked and how plants worked and everything else. So there's an interest there, but I just can't apply it to this academic system we've got. Didn't fit in with it, really. So what am I going to do with it? And there and then, I thought the only thing I can do with it is make my life as worthwhile as possible. Sounds really corny, but that's what I resolved to do when I was 15 years old, staring down the park, bunking off from physics or whatever it was. And that has driven me ever since. So they sent me on an outward bound course, my school, that is. And the outward bound course in those days, and this is 1976, was a make a man out of you, outward bound, and it's supposed to break you down and fills you up again. I was quite a shy and retiring person. I wasn't a brash extrovert, although I loved acting because there was a lovely facade there. But I was put in charge of a group of 12 people, some of which were 10 years older than me. And it was the first time I realized that actually I could, I could lead people. So I had something to offer the group in terms of natural ability, I suppose. Sounds a bit cocky now, but... I found out that I could lead people. And the reason I could lead people is because I listened to them and I watched them and I was empathetic and I was considerate and I was kind. Things that we don't really think about these days in corporate life, certainly. But if you are that, then you get a good camaraderie around you. People begin to trust you. And you wear, if you wear your heart on your sleeve, people begin to wear you, trust you. And I'm very open with people who come into my system now, and I call it the brutal honesty bit. If you're brutally honest with yourself, and you, that allows you to get to know yourself and be accepting of the fact that I am human, I can fail, I can make mistakes, I am not infallible. A lot of us pretend to do in everyday life. So there you go. That was my introduction. At the same time, they had this wonderful library of exploration at this place, this outward bound school up in the mountains. And this was winter, so it's quite a harsh course. But I, it was the first time, honestly, that I picked up a book and read it from cover to cover. I'd always skimped through books and wasn't a good reader at all. But they were the stories of Daring Do, the golden era of exploration, and I haven't stopped reading them now. Nowadays, I know what spin, bluff and nonsense and... or can take a good guess anyway and what's probably real so they have hey, what inspired you to actually become a scientist so history was a complete waste of time who wants to know about history history is written by the people that win <laughs> yeah so i didn't want to know about history 
Geography, I liked geography, that was okay. But science was all about how this thing worked, whatever this thing is, how this thing works, and how someone has actually had the ingenuity to work it out. So I liked that. Plants, because plants are all about food, generation of food. And so even though I was a strapping rugby player, you'd find me out in the daisy field identifying sunflower with a book as well, even at that stage. But I was fascinated about how the sun came down, you get this chemical reaction going on, photosynthesis occurs, you get energy out the other side, and then that energy is used to grow some plant we can eat. Fantastic. Amazing. Thoroughly interested in that. But the next stage, I managed to scrape enough qualifications, A-levels we used to call them, to get to university. I had a place at university in Strathclyde, but I wanted to get on with life. It was a four-year course. The first year would have been repeating what I'd done in more or less up to that stage. So I didn't want to do that. So I thought, what can I do? I wrote to 17 different scientific stations, and these were letters that we wrote by hand. Sent them off and cut a long story short, within two weeks, the Grasslands Research Institute in Hurley, just west of London, gave me a job as an assistant scientific officer. But I was working, I was incredibly lucky. I was working for an eminent scientist who was working on the depletion of the ozone layer as a result of agricultural practices, which is really where my desire for climate stuff was solidified, if you like. I, it was fantastic work. The ozone layer had only just been discovered, and this went around the sort of scientific community. It wasn't even in the public domain at that stage. And so working on it was just fantastic. And then we went on to, to work on the fate of fertilizer, nitrogen in every which way, shape, and form. So polluting the ground waters and eutrophication of waters with runoff and all sorts of atmospheric nitrous oxide emissions and things like that. So fantastic, fantastic job. 18 months into the job, he collapsed in my arms with the exhaustion, this fantastic eminent scientist called Dr. John Ryden, and he couldn't continue the work, which meant that I had to up my game, learn all the maths that I hadn't learned at school to process the data, learn about computers to process the data, learn about how to write a scientific paper and what have you. I, it was only he and I working on this important work. I had to take up the mantle, and, and I did, which surprised me. It's amazing, isn't it? And gave me a real sense of purpose. I was doing something fantastic for the planet. I was doing something I was totally fulfilled in because it was in, in genius. I had to be ingenious in order to invent this stuff that would measure this stuff. And then I had to carry it out as well. Yeah. So that's how I started in science. So bring the two together, your science and your desire to lead and your love of the outdoors. How did that lead you to polar expeditions, the Arctic and ice, and that aspect of it. I don't know how many hours you've got, but I shall condense it into a couple of minutes. <laughs> but it's, it all made sense to me, let's just put it that way. So I was in science. I couldn't get any further without going back to university. Didn't want to do that complete waste of time. I was out there doing it. What could they teach me that I wouldn't teach myself in order to produce the kind of important stuff that I was producing. I couldn't get any further. They wouldn't allow me to get any further. So I had been since Outward Bound, a, a mountaineer, and gone off and climbed mountains and been on mountain rescue teams and things like that. And so I thought, how can I be paid reasonably? Because I had a family by now, one child. How can I be paid reasonably to work in the outdoors, put my skills to to, to good effect. And the only real way of doing that at the time was to join the military. So I joined the military. Wasn't militaristic in any way, shape or form. Rather like school, I was a naughty boy in basic training and spent most of the time cleaning a toilet with a toothbrush You're under naughty, naughty boy rules. And I bent every rule I could possibly find. If they didn't put in black and white that you couldn't climb that term. Um, that tower or something, then I did it as part of the exercises. And I've been the same ever since, actually, in everything I've done. So anyway, cut a long story short, the military was fantastic. I had a short, sharp introduction. Hadn't seen my family for ages because I'd been working over in Norway in the Arctic 
first foray into the Arctic in 1984. And they then offered me 15 months mopping up after some incident in the Falklands, Falkland Islands. I said, no, thank you very much and left. Re retrained completely in marketing communications because I knew a bit from a bite. I had a very specific niche when the likes of IBM and digital, as they called them in those days, started to market properly. And so I sat between the techies and the creatives, almost translating between the two. So earned a fortune, late 80s, I was earning a six-figure sal salary, got all the bells and whistles, didn't motivate me whatsoever. One day, on a Monday, and I remember it distinctly, I was sat there with my huge laptop computer and I was going into my office later on in the cent centre of London in Piccadilly. But I was sat there on my computer and my cleaner, I was that affluent, I had a cleaner for the house. <laughs> and she said to me, she turned around and said to me, and I don't know why she said this, she said, Jim, do you know the local fire brigade? They're looking for people. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And I just couldn't understand why she asked me that or brought that up. But I don't know, 20 minutes later, I just totally puzzled. And I thought, hang on, the fire brigade, they've got a lot of skills that I've got, technical skills and love the critical crisis management. And I thought, um, maybe it's not a bad idea. So I presented myself that evening to the local fire station and said, look, Medically trained, oh, I love the critical crisis management bit. Are those skills any good to you? And I just hit it at a sweet spot where they didn't have enough breathing apparatus wearers, they didn't have enough drivers, they didn't have enough this, that and the other in my local authority fire and rescue team. So I, another long story that I'll cut short. Within two years, I'd been trained up to my eyeballs in everything fire and rescue. And also academically, ironically, because I became a graduate of the Institute of Fire Engineering, because I liked it. How does fire happen? It's a really dangerous thing. How do you extricate someone, you know, from a crashed vehicle in the best possible time? It's all about physics and mechanics and everything else. So anyway, I loved it. And then down the road, Windsor Castle, which is one of the last great fortresses in the UK here, had a massive fire. And so I wrote a cheeky letter to the to the constable of the castle saying, if you want someone that's newly qualified, I might have some expertise that would stop that happening again and burning the country's assets. Within two weeks, he gave me the job of being fire officer for the royal household. So I was working two fire brigades at the same time, one on call, one on sharp stuff, road traffic accident specialist I became, and one cerebral, all about fire protection and looking after the country's assets. And... All the time I'd been doing expeditionary stuff since the outbound days. And I thought, what can I do that's even more positive for my situation? And I thought it will be lovely to have a project that emulated, that copied the golden era of exploration. When they put, well, they called for volunteers and they put them on a boat and they sent them off. They didn't even know where they were going what they were going to face, or when they were going to come back, which is an amazing thing. We couldn't quite do that, especially for the polar region, but we could train people to be modern-day polar explorers and go out there and do something purposeful and worthwhile. So I stopped being an adventurer when I was 22 years old and started becoming a, an explorer. And that's what I've been doing ever since, right? So you've had, essentially... Six or seven careers in your lifespan so far. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so let's head over to the Ocean Warrior Project. How did that take shape? And the fact that it is a process that is going to take over 10 years. You have literally planned it out to take place over 10 years. Tell us a little bit about the thought process that went into that. Well, Ice Warrior, which has now been going 22 years and gathered loads and loads of data, was always the model to take it into the other extreme environments. Extreme environments for about 70 years now have been accepted as a sort of barometer of change, the indicators of change. Whatever happens in those extreme environments is going to happen first and then spread across the world. Yes, let's do the polar stuff and see how much the ice is declining and how much the heat 
is coming off the ocean, but let's go do the other ones as well. So it's taken me 22 years to create the next strand, which is Ocean Warrior. And I created that in the first part of this year. And because it's a model of what's happened in Ice Warrior, accelerated growth has been fantastic. I know what I'm doing, in other words. Yeah. And therefore, we do reach out to ordinary people. And that's very important. If you don't engage ordinary people, I want to speak to the person in the street and I want to, them to get their head out of the sand and prick up their ears and realize that they can do something about this. And so if you get ordinary people on board, if you train them in that environment, then, you know, they've got their own communities. And so they're living next door to someone else and their neighbors go, oh, hey, maybe I ought to listen. And they learn something. There's an education part of things. There's an informative part of things. There's an engagement of a bigger, wider audience than you'd have otherwise. So I think it's incredibly important that we have these citizen scientists. But at the same time, on a boat, you're limited with space. So you've got to do the most important science that you possibly can. And so, you know, half the boat is dedicated to scientists and up and coming scientists to train them as well. But it is all about getting out there into places that are seldom, if ever, visited by scientists to do the same route 10 years in a row, 10,000 nautical miles per year. So over 100,000 nautical miles by the time we finish and resample and resample, benchmark, measure, benchmark, monitor and report on what's happening along that route for the next 10 years. What I find really remarkable, it isn't driven by a company. It isn't driven by anybody that is searching for certain results. It is simply scientific. It is, what are we going to find out? We're not trying to do this for the fossil fuel industry. We're not trying to do this for the green economy. We are doing this as scientists to get the facts. How do you raise money? How are you managing to keep this non-commercial? It's difficult. It's difficult at times. I don't, there are two, only two people, myself and my wife, that actually get paid in on a full-time basis. We have lots of other part-time people that come in and God bless them and help us tremendously. But that's, it's all based on how much we can afford. And my wife and I pay ourselves £12,000 a year each, and then the rest goes plow, plowing back into whatever we can establish with that. I found out years ago, having earned six-figure salaries, that that didn't float my boat, and actually you don't really need a lot to survive, and you don't really need a lot to be happy. And the two most important things in life are happiness and health. And I, don't, I always said to my three children, I don't care what you do, as long as you're happy and you're healthy. And if they're happy, they probably found purpose. They're probably a nice person. They're probably kind and empathetic. That's what I've found in life. Anyway. But yeah, it is absolutely all about getting to the truth. This is empirical data that we're collecting. And so it's indisputable. No one can dispute it. And I won't have anyone have any influence over that data whatsoever. And it'll be in the public domain. Tell me about the boat. The boats, we're so lucky. It's a lovely boat. It's 45 and a half meters long. It's a double wooden hulled, copper bottomed, three masted, largest wooden schooner in Europe. So it's, and it's really comfortable. It's really comfortable and really practicable, apart from the ice bit, <laughs> perhaps. But then, at the turn of the last century, there was nothing but wooden vessels going up, exploring those regions. So I think when it comes to expertise, I found the vessel and I found the expertise and the captains of that vessel as well, who had a long, long history and family history, indeed going back many generations of seafaring in very difficult terrain. Yeah, we've got the perfect boat and that foundation expeditions are going to be fitting out that boat, setting it up, seeing what we can do which areas we have to have as clean laboratory areas, how we're going to run the water through the hull, all sorts of things that we're going to be investigating. And we've got some fantastic scientific partners already on the project, and it only launched it eight months ago. There is a big move to be carbon neutral by 2030. Now, this project goes over the 2030 benchmark. What are you doing 
to ensure that this expedition is as carbon neutral as possible? Uh, looking at all the technologies, and I'm a stickler for technologies, particularly those that seem to work. I'm a great advocate of hydrogen. It's the most abundant element we've got if we can harness it properly. And there are, if you look at the scientists, the technologists, there are people out there that are doing this and doing it very effectively and efficiently. Scaling up is the job of commerce. And so if you can manage to convince commerce that this is something that they can make money out of, then you've got the best of both worlds. And there are people out there that are doing this. And so we're part of this looking at the boat is to look at the engine system that we've got at the moment, see if we can run it on nitrogen, see if we can run it on ammonia, see what we can do to improve that. We're going to have every conceivable renewable energy, harvesting energy you know, that we can think of on the vessel by the time I've finished, if I've got anything to do with it. Uh, it sounds like you do. If people want to feel as if they're part of the project, if they want to donate and be for their own sake and for yours, of course, but to give something to feel like they are part of, of change for the future, how can they go about doing that? Just follow us and look at our website. There are donation buttons on our website. And uh, yeah, fantastic. Please be part of it. We want to build up a community, really, that is doing good. And we're going to shout about it. I, I am probably the least most known explorer in the world, I think. But now is the time I've got to put my head above the parapet and really shout. You'll see me doing so. And when it comes to the data that you extract, is that something that will be transparent to everybody as soon as you have it and continually so throughout that 10 years? Well, this is one of the big things. Science is wonderful. It's peer-reviewed, but that peer-reviewing process takes a long time. So the scientist that does the research here will only actually produce their conclusions in 18 months if they're lucky by the time it's been peer-reviewed. What we want to do is put a, a better finger on that pulse, a better, more immediate finger on that pulse of the planet by looking at these extreme environments. So we're going to anecdotally, under the guise of the best scientists we can get hold of, say what's going on, what we're finding, and what may be the conclusion of what we're finding. Like with plastics, it's obvious that you've got a cubic meter of water. How much plastic have you got in there? No one can dispute that. You haven't got the scientific results of that survey, but it's there in front of you. And much the same with other bits and pieces that we'll be measuring. So it's about measuring all those things and getting them across. So technology-wise, we're hoping to engage communications, state-of-the-art communications, which means we can report almost, if not live from the boat in real time. And what is in my heart is a massive, great big computer dashboard that gives all our results out and people can interrogate this dashboard to the nth degree, getting really delved into the science, why that's important, even into the chemistry and the physics, if I had my way. But on the face of it, a child can go up to it and press a polar bear and find out all about polar bears. That's what I've got in my heart. That's what I want to put out to every grocery store or whatever. So you're creating the next generation of scientists too? I think science is, a, I suppose, a natural way in many respects of making us more civilized. If we're not looking at how our impact is, how can we know that we're doing right or wrong? We're not looking at these areas in the greatest of depth, if you pardon the pun. How do we know that anything we do to recycle, reuse and everything is actually making a positive effect? We don't. So I think science underpins everything. Jim, I want to say it's been an absolute pleasure to get to know you. And thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us. Well, thank you very much for featuring it and hope you follow it. You have been listening to Jim McNeil from the Ocean Warrior Project. We will provide all of the information below this interview if you are interested in following, supporting, or just becoming part of the journey and learning about the science and how our world is impacted and our environment is impacted. Thank you for tuning in. You've been watching another edition of Yaku Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. 
My name is Rhea. I have been your host. We'll see you again next time.